Let's start today with a special announcement. If you want to experience the energy of Relationship Alive in person, then come to Portland, Maine on Thursday, June 6th, 2019 for Relationship Alive Live. Our featured guest will be the esteemed Terry Real, author of The New Rules of Marriage and creator of Relational Life Therapy. We'll also have musical guest, Katie Matzel, who's a local favorite here in Portland, and the chance for you to ask Terry and me your most pressing relationship questions. And overall, it's gonna be a really good time. Two hours of fun and growth, and way cheaper than a couples therapy session. The show will be starting at 7 p.m. sharp with doors opening at 6.30 and will be at One Longfellow Square, an amazing intimate room with limited seating available. And Terry's also going to be available after the show for a book signing. So to purchase your tickets, visit neilsatin.com slash tickets. And I'm looking forward to seeing you there. Now about today's episode, have you ever wished that you and your partner could communicate better with one another and avoid conflict. Communication can feel really complex, but today we're going to show you some very specific and practical exercises that you can do with your partner that will improve your communication, your mindset, and your overall satisfaction in your relationship. Along those lines, if you haven't downloaded it yet, make sure that you grab a free copy of my top three relationship communication secrets. These are three simple yet effective ways to keep you connected with your partner, no matter how challenging the topic that you're communicating about. And it's free. So just visit neilsatin.com slash relate or text the word relate to the number 33444 to get the guide. I also wanted to offer you some gratitude. First, there have been some great new iTunes reviews coming in, which I not only love to read, but they also help Relationship Alive rise to the top of the search results when people are looking for good relationship podcasts. So thank you for that. And we also had our best month ever for downloads this past March, which must be because you are helping to get the word out about the show. You never know when someone you know might need a little support. So letting your friends know about Relationship Alive keeps it top of mind when they need a resource to get through a challenging time, or they just need to find ways to juice things up in their life and in their relationship. So sharing in person with your friends helps, sharing on social media really helps, whatever you can do is helpful. I also want to give a huge thank you to our listener supporters, especially this week, Denise, Anne, Ben, Angie, Barrett, and Cynthia. We couldn't keep the lights on here at Relationship Alive headquarters without your help, and every little bit makes a difference. So if you find Relationship Alive to be helpful and want to support our mission, just visit neilsatin.com support or text the word support to the number 33444 to choose something that feels right for you. And lastly, if you wanna find like-minded people and a safe space to get support for your relationship, just join the Relationship Alive community on Facebook, where I'm there along with close to 3,000 other people to uh, help you in your relationship and support you. All right. I think that's it. Let's get on with the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of Relationship Alive. This is your host, Neil Satin. Today we're going to get really practical, and we're going to get really practical about communication. But not only are we going to get practical about communication, we're also going to get practical about communication in a way that will bring you closer to your partner. And we're also going to address this from the perspective of things that you can do with your partner, structured exercises that will definitely take you to a new level of understanding and intimacy and vulnerability. And on top of that, we're going to get some 
tips about how to do things on your own, kind of renegade style, so that if your partner isn't necessarily signing up for communication uh, exercises 101, uh, you can still make huge progress in your relationship and your connection. And in order to have today's conversation, we have with us yet another esteemed guest. His name is Jonathan Robinson, and he's the author of the book, More Love, Less Conflict, a communication playbook for couples, among many other books. Uh, Jonathan has worked with many couples, has worked with Fortune 500 companies, and has been featured on TV and media. Notably, he was on Oprah several times. And as you'll see, his words are practical, uh, applicable to your life, and they make a lot of sense, but they're not necessarily the kind of thing that you would automatically think to do. They're the kinds of things that once you hear them, you'll be like, oh yeah, of course, that's the way I should have been doing this all along. So I'm excited to have Jonathan here with us today. We are going to dive in momentarily, but before we do, just a reminder that if you want to download a detailed transcript of today's episode, you can visit neilsatin.com slash more love. That's the word more and the word love kind of squished together. And uh, along with the transcript, Jonathan Robinson has also generously offered to combine with that his 50 desires. It's a list of things that are these universal desires that can, as you'll see, help you really get more in touch with what it is you're after anyway in, in your relationship and in any given moment. So that is also free for you um, when you download the transcript. And again, that's at neilsatin.com slash more love. Or you can simply text the word passion to the number 33444 and follow the instructions, which will lead you to a page where you can download the transcript, the bonus, desires, worksheet, and a lot of other goodies as well from our other episodes. I think that's it for now. Jonathan Robinson, thank you so much for being here with us today on Relationship Alive. Well, thank you, Neil. This will be fun. I sure hope so. Let's see. How can we make it fun? Let's just start right in with something like super fun. Um, one thing that I really appreciate about your book, as I just mentioned, is how practical it is not only for people who have a partner who's willing to sit down with them and, and go through something structured, but also the way that you're always offering these helpful hints that allow someone to just kind of incorporate it into their lives on their own and, and change the steps of the dance. And I'm wondering, obviously, ideally, our partners work with us on, on the project of our relationships, but I'm wondering what you've seen as far as um, people taking some of these um, plays or in, in your communication playbook and and putting them into practice on their own and what kinds of results you've seen them effect in their relationships? Well, in fact, it's pretty rare to have two partners that both want to work on a relationship. Uh, if you have that, usually there's not that much of a problem. So mostly I get couples who are basically on the verge of divorce where one person is dragged in kicking and screaming. And even in those situations, if you have the right method, the right technology, so to speak, you can still get to a place of love often in like 20 minutes. So, you know, I, I use the analogy, if you're trying to go from where you are in Portland, Maine to California, well, if you have a plane, you can do it in six hours. If you don't have a plane, it's going to take you, you know, a couple of years. So some of these tools are really like amazing technology that help us get back to a place of love very quickly. And how, I mean, some of them I, I, I noticed like, okay, that kind of reminds me of Imago or that reminds me of something I've seen in the Gottman's work and has, have some of those things just been trial and error on your part or what, what's that process of discovery like for you and in coming up with these ways to, to help people in their communication? Well, I use it in my own marriage, but also with my clients. And what I notice is that when people are upset, 
they can't remember Imago stuff or Gottman stuff necessarily. They're too complex for most couples. So I tried to make it so that anything I taught in my book could be pretty well done in 20 seconds or less. Now, there's a few exceptions, but I know when I'm really stressed out or upset, I don't remember all the theory. What I remember is maybe I can say three words or maybe I can complete a sentence. So I tried to find the best and easiest methods that can be done usually in under 20 seconds. And that's usually what people actually can do. But the good news is if they do it, it does lead to a transformation. Like, you know, my wife and I, when we first married, we argued a lot. And I was looking for a way that even though we were upset, we could avoid arguments. So I came up with a method called the yellow light method, which just involves saying two words. And if I can say, remember to say those two words, uh, we avoid arguments. And in the last five years, we've only had one argument. And basically the method is, you know, if you're finding that you're upset or your partner's upset, either of you can say yellow light. And that's a signal to take two minutes out and take some deep breaths and then restart the conversation. And when you interrupt that momentum of upset, uh, usually you don't go into an argument. So those are the type of methods I like the most, the ones that are so simple yet work pretty much 100% of the time. Yeah, I, it's so important too to have something reliable that you can turn to that doesn't require a lot of thought because as we've talked about here on the show a lot, you're not even really able to think that part of your brain that accesses creative problem-solving thinking it tends to go offline as soon as you start to feel your heart beating a little more quickly and and get into that disconnected, angry or hurt, wanting to escape, angry, wanting to fight, whatever it is. When you're in that mode, having to think it through is probably one of the most challenging things you could have to do. Yeah, I can't do it, so I can't expect other people to, <laughs> you know. <laughs> That's why they, they, they pass, these methods have passed the most severe test possible. Do they actually work in my life? Yeah, that's uh, that's super important. And I like, too, that, you know, you offer examples in the book of things that happen with your wife. It's kind of a, a, a new theme here on the show because I think it's easy to get the impression that when you know all this stuff about relationships that, like, things are smooth sailing all the time and it's never challenging and you know even people you know people like the Gottmans they must just never fight it's always bliss it's always you know cherishing and uh and so lately I've been asking my guests you know to to name some of their own challenges just to like make it real and so I like that you offer that in your book as well like these are challenges we've experienced and how we've how I've used this particular exercise or how my wife and I have used it to to help ourselves in these moments. Yeah, that's been, you know, a way to keep it honest because we all face challenges in relationships. It's just a matter of whether you have ways of getting around those challenges or if you resort to the time-tested, tried and true method that most couples work or use, which is blame. And as you know, Neil, blame never works. Yeah. You never once Never once have I blamed my wife for for my uh, annoyance or blamed her and telling her what she does wrong, where she then came back and said, oh, yeah, now I see what you're talking about. I'm going to have to change that. That, that I, I bat zero for 500 on that one. So that, that got me looking for other ways to do it. Yeah. Yeah. It, and it's funny how ineffective so many of our innate strategies are and yet without a new repertoire that that's just what you do over and over again even though if you were to step back and look at the evidence did this work did anything change do i feel more connected like any of that the answer would probably be no for most of those things people just do blame complain uh Shame. Shame. Yeah, exactly. Um, criticize. Um, yeah, all those kinds of things. Um, well, most of us, yeah. most couples don't even have 15 minutes of communication 
uh, education in their life. And I think of a marriage or communication is something that we're doing all the time. We should have a lot of a lot of practice at it. You know, if you if you even had 15 minutes on how to fly a plane, you would have a chance of not crashing. But if you don't have those 15 minutes and you have to take over a plane in mid-flight, you're probably going to crash. And that's an experience a lot of couples have is that they just don't have any other methods they've been taught other than blame, shame, complain. And therefore, that's what they, the habit they fall back into when, when things get tense. Yeah. Yeah. Well, fortunately, we don't just have 15 minutes now. We have a good 45 minutes where we can help you who are listening um, come up the curve a little bit more. We're going to give you some cool exercises and things to try. And um, and then I'm just thinking about the study that I, I just had John and Julie Gottman on the show. And they were talking about this study where there were these married couples, I think they had children, both worked, and they figured out that basically these people had 15 minutes of communication time, period, over the course of a week, like mm. that that was it. And of course, that time was was more or less about the bills and logistics. And um, so if we can save you, save that for you so that that 15 minutes can be something truly special... And hopefully you have more than 15 minutes with your partner or with the people closest to you, then um, I'll feel like we did a good job here today, Jonathan. That sounds good. Awesome. So what's a, where's a good place to start? Um, I know that I mentioned um, your the universal desires when, when I first was talking about what we're going to talk about today. And maybe that would be a good place for us to just kind of drop in. Um, but I, I'm open to your influence here about like, where do you like to start people out on this journey? Well, you mentioned the Gottmans and they've done some great work. And one of the things I liked about them is they said that probably the best predictor of how happy couples are is the amount of appreciations they give to each other or the ratio of appreciations to criticism. So a very simple method, and you know, I like simple, is that um, I have couples complete this sentence. Something I noticed today about you that I appreciate is, and you just complete that sentence. I have couples do that once a day. And people are often hesitant, like, oh, that's too simple or too mechanical. But it really does make a huge difference. And, you know, I'm, I'm a typical guy, so I actually have my iPhone remind me to do this every day. Otherwise, I forget. And it's amazing how that can really help bond couples. Or if I did it with you, Neil, you know, something I noticed about you that I appreciate is that you're very clear in your communication. You know, we had to do some scheduling stuff, but you were always very clear and helpful and, you know, before the show, during the show, uh, it just makes it much easier to be a guest when I know where you're at and what you're thinking. So I'm already thinking that thought, but when we say our appreciations, it helps to more bond, whether it be a couple or friendship. And that's something that's so easy to do that most people are missing out on because they don't make it a habit. Yeah, yeah. And and when I think about, for, for a lot of us, that can equal love or feeling loved is like it, it gets conflated with, with appreciation. And so it's like you don't really feel like you're being loved by your partner if you're not getting that kind of acknowledgement from them about how you shine in their eyes. Exactly. Uh, it's, it's probably the uh, quickest way for couples to feel emotionally connected. And, and I really like the sentence stem approach. Um, something I noticed about you today that I appreciate is like, I think that's good because it gives someone it gives us a way to focus our attention rather than like being in you know lost in the sea of all the 
the possible appreciations. It's like pull mm-hmm. something out of out of today, out of this moment. Um, because I can imagine even just sitting down with my wife Chloe and and that what it would what it feels like to have her attention like even that in in the moment would be something I would really appreciate. I'd probably want to sh- reflect that right back to her, just like how good it feels to 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 experience her listening to me. Um, and yeah, yeah. Um, I like I like the method of sentence stems because they're so simple and yet can be so effective. Uh, you know, just I'll, I'll put out a couple more of the ones I really like. Great. Uh, one is. Um, something I've been hesitant to talk to you about lately is, you know, that helps bring in the difficult things that we sometimes avoid. Or how about this one? You know, if you're in a a disagreement and you're both trying to blame each other, um, to use this sentence stem, a way I see that I contributed to this upset is, Mm. you know, you, you say that and it immediately changes the, energy of the conversation because now you're taking some responsibility which then leads to your partner doing that so there's a lot of sentence stems in the more love less conflict book that work really powerfully and immediately and they only take 20 seconds to complete yeah and that that um one you just named for diffusing conflict um i i experienced that just the other day where you know, Chloe and I, we had an argument about something. Oh, I remember exactly what it was. I um, Sometimes our lives get a little busy. And I, I think I've even mentioned on the show before that there can be dishes in the sink. And, and you know, we each could be responsible for doing more dishes, I think. Um, our dog sometimes does more dishes than we do. And... Mm. Um, and so there were no dishes. I was in a rush. I was making a meal. And I, we have a stack of special dishes that we're really not supposed to use. But rather than um, use a dish, I actually, come to think of it, I had just washed a bunch of dishes, but they were still wet. And I didn't want to dry the dish with a towel. So I just like reached for the special dish from the pile of special dishes. And... Chloe got really angry at me like don't use one of those dishes you you just washed all of those dishes like I've asked you not to use those dishes so so you know innocent enough I'm reaching for the dishes and and it would have been so easy for me to to just get really angry and in fact I did get angry I was like you know don't tell me what to do you know it was like really a glorious moment for us of of conflict and we each stepped away for a minute or two because we had been under a lot of stress that day, a lot of pressure. And then I came back and I said something like, um, I, I really, I'm really sorry that I just yelled, um, or I just yelled at you, um, just then. Um, I see that I took one, I went to use one of those dishes and I know you've asked me not to use them a lot. And, even though I feel like it's my right <laughs> to take them, I recognize that you asked me not to, and I did anyway. And and I can see how that must have felt like I was slighting you or not not really paying attention to what you've asked me to do in the past. And I will say that um, it didn't sound exactly like that when I when I said it to her, but it was it was along those lines. And it was really hard and painful for me to say that because like mm. you mentioned in your book, like my ego just wanted to be right and wanted to make her wrong for having spoken up about it or tried to control me or whatever it was, right? It's That was her part in the dance, but I did have my part in the dance. And through owning it, right afterwards, Chloe said, yeah, I really like the way that I, that I, um, said that I'm you know I'm really sorry I know that must have you must have felt like I was really coming down on you or talking down to you or something like that is what she said and and it's like that was it like argument over (laughs) and we kind of like went back to just being connected and and loving and it and it was a a really quick transformation um it's amazing because that gap from Maine to California that you were talking about earlier that can feel like it's gonna take two years and it really can be as quick as uh, as quick as making a shift like that. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, 
it can be hard to figure out the right thing to say on your own. But if you have the first part of the sentence, like memorized, like, I see the way that I contributed to this upset is. Then it becomes relatively easy and easier on your ego to just say that sentence. And then the shift happens. So I always try to take these big ideas like taking responsibility or or being more appreciative and turn them into a method or a technology that's so simple that even me at my worst can do it. Mm. Yeah. And it seems like that's really what people need because we often know the theory, we often know what we're supposed to do, but when the rubber hits the road, we don't have that key word to say that is really going to turn it in a new direction. Yeah. Yeah. What are, are there other magical sentence stems that come to mind? Uh, well, there's like 30 of them in the book. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll spread them out through this interview. Uh, one thing that I like uh, as a sentence stem is um, just saying, right now I'm feeling whatever you're feeling, and then, and right now I'm wanting whatever you're wanting. Because saying what you're feeling and wanting is really key information for your, for your partner. And normally we're very indirect. We're very uh, not good at saying that in a way that our partner gets. Mm. So, you know, during the day, if I'm spending time with my wife, I'll think that sentence stem. Hmm, right now I'm feeling like I want to be more connected with you. And I guess I'm wanting a hug right now. And that helps point me in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's important. You talk about this in in the book, um, in the chapter where, where you're covering that sentence stem in particular, um, how important it is to identify what you're actually feeling versus... Um, you know, I'm feeling like you're being an idiot right now, or I'm, you know, like <laughs> I'm, which is what people sometimes tend to do, which is to take an I feel statement and, and attach a judgment on the end of it, as opposed to just owning what they're actually feeling in that moment. Yeah, that's why I have in, in the book, uh, a page of just feelings, you know, here are 30 feelings, you're probably feeling one of these, uh, you're not feeling, even if you're thinking, I'm feeling like they're an idiot. What you're probably feeling is I'm feeling annoyed or I'm feeling frustrated. And to some extent, that's a learning process because a lot of couples don't have that practice where they say, well, this really isn't a feeling. What, is, what am I feeling? So having a list in front of you can actually be very helpful that way. Right, yeah. Won't that be great when I think you talk about this in terms of languages and communication, but, you know, to be able to kind of like Google, how am I feeling right now? And, and get like an, <laughs> oh, looks, look, turns out that I'm feeling annoyed right now. Um, that makes sense, actually. <laughs> Thanks, yeah, Google. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and then the second part of that stem, I'm, I'm feeling this and, and what I'd really like is, and I, I think I'm not getting it quite right, but, um, but that last part of really being able to identify what it is you would like and and what the desire might be underneath that seems yeah. so important for people to get clear on. Yeah, there's really two things that people want. They want, uh, and usually it looks like I want them to give me a certain action, like maybe a hug or I want them to do the dishes. But underneath that, we think that if they did those things, we would get a certain desire fulfilled. Like if they gave me a hug, I'd feel more connected. Or if they did the dishes, I'd feel more respected or something like that. So knowing what the ultimate aim is, the ultimate desire or need you're trying to fulfill can be very helpful because they might do the dishes in a way that you know is throwing the dishes around and being upset while they're doing it. And the dishes get done, but you don't feel more respected at the end of it. Right. Right. And, um, you know, how useful is it for you to be clear about that with your partner so that the, the underlying motivations are 
like the realm that you're dealing in, not not trying in this roundabout way to get your your needs or desires met. And in fact, most partners are much more um, open to satisfying our underlying desires than they are to satisfying our uh, other requests. Like if you said, well, I want you to do the dishes, they might have some resistance. But if you said, what I'm really wanting is I'm wanting to feel more respected and more connected to you. That tends to be more vulnerable. And vulnerability is a real key to intimacy. You know, if you look at the word intimacy, the instructions are there, into me see. So when we reveal what we're really wanting on an emotional level, that tends to open up our partner's hearts and makes them more uh, connected and more open to uh, doing what we want. Yeah, and then does it make sense to you to follow up with, you know, once your partner's offered vulnerability like that to ask what could I do that would help you feel seen and respected or yeah yeah exactly and then they'll say you could do the dishes (laughs) (laughs) actually probably just asking what can i do to help you feel more respected would help them to feel more respected true uh but the dishes might be another way as well it might be but what occurs to me is that um it's more likely that if the dishes were kind of a surrogate for that feeling seen and respected that now that the the true desire is out in the open that on on further reflection someone might be like well the dishes would be nice but what would really help me feel seen and respected would be you know if i could talk to you about my day and have you just listen with your undivided attention right you're getting you're getting to a place where you're much more effective in satisfying your partner's real needs. And that's something that's really critical because a lot of times partners don't even know what their partner's real needs are. And they, even if they do know what they are, which is unusual, they may be very ineffective in satisfying them. I mean, take the issue of sex, which is a good example. A lot of couples don't ever directly say what they most enjoy in bed. So they find that they put up with their partner doing things, which is not really what really does it for them. So here's a good sentence, Tim. Three things I really love that you do in bed are, and three things that I really don't care for much are. Just completing that sentence can improve your love life 50% in five minutes. Jonathan, we're going to take just a moment to talk about this week's sponsor, and they have a special offer for you as a Relationship Alive listener. Now, Jonathan's book, More Love, Less Conflict, is such a great read, full of practical wisdom on every page to help you in your relationship. And that being said, sometimes you don't need to read the whole book to get what matters most and grow and transform. And in those moments, today's sponsor is perfect for you. Their name is Blinkist. When we're overwhelmed with work and other aspects of life, it can be challenging to be super growth oriented and to do a lot of reading. It's just tough to fit it all in during a day. However, the Blinkist app will help you take charge of your own growth and expand your knowledge in a way that fits into your busy life. Blinkist is the only app that takes the best key takeaways, the need to know information from thousands of nonfiction books and condenses them down into just 15 minutes that you can read or listen to. That way you can just drop in and get the main points of the books quickly, which is a great way to feed your personal growth and development. With over 8 million users, Blinkist has a massive and growing library from self-help to business to health to history books. For instance, you can check out uh, Michelle Obama's new book, Becoming, or uh, The Art of Happiness by the Dalai Lama. So as I've mentioned before, Blinkist has been perfect for me. I read so many books for the show, but Blinkist has been a great way for me to take a quick but deep dive into a book, especially if it's something that interests me, but I don't have the time to commit to reading the whole thing. So when I want to read a business book or something about politics or 
just get to know a book better so I can decide whether I want to pursue it more deeply, I turn to Blinkist. And right now, for a limited time, Blinkist has a special offer just for you. Go to Blinkist.com slash alive to start your free seven-day trial. You can check out all the books that you've been wanting to read at a fraction of the time. Again, that's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist.com slash alive to start your free seven-day trial. Blinkist.com slash alive. And now let's get back to our conversation with Jonathan Robinson. And thank you so much, Blinkist, for sponsoring this episode of Relationship Alive. I'm curious for you, like, when someone hears, like, three things I love are blank, that's going to feel really good. Things, Three things that I don't particularly care for, it seems like it would be really easy for the person receiving that to, if nothing else, just kind of feel bad about it, but maybe even to go into a shame spiral or, you know, it could be really bad. Um, so what what do you recommend people do to help create a safe container for offering uh, more negative feedback? I have a lot of suggestions for that in the More Love, Less Conflict book. Um, one example is always end on a positive note, either something you appreciate or something that you like. But sometimes what's necessary is just a, a, a time out. Like if you're going to give some kind of feedback that's negative, that the other person can't respond for, say, 12 hours. Because a lot of times we have an immediate reaction, and then after five minutes we realize, well, that's actually useful feedback or it's no big deal. So creating that safe container can be either ending with something positive or creating a time period where neither person can react to it. Yeah, and during that time period, what do you suggest people do to take care of themselves if they, if they need that? Uh-huh. Uh, I actually do make several suggestions and I have a list, you know, from watching funny YouTube videos to calling a friend to going to the gym. But I find that if couples are feeling connected and they feel respected and appreciated and they're doing all those other things, when you get a little bit of, quote, negative feedback, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't overwhelm them. What happens normally is that people aren't getting any positive stuff, so that when they get another piece of negative feedback, it can overwhelm them, and then you get into problems. So as long as you have kind of love in your emotional bank account, so to speak, a little bit of feedback that uh, tells you how you can do something better usually is not that big of a deal. Mm. Yeah, so important to probably to put your focus on some of the things we were talking about a moment ago, like offering the appreciations and all the ways that you really do uh, appreciate or resonate with your, with your partner, or the things that you love about them or the things that you see in them so that when it comes time to offer something a little bit more um, discerning, let's say, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you're, it, it it can soften the blow a little bit. And yeah, and th and there's other ways too. For example, sometimes I have couples uh, give uh, what could be called negative feedback in a written form while ending with a positive thing. And it can be easier to just read it and take some time on your own rather than have that person right there, which might be more triggering. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways to create a safe container and people's job is to find what works for them because different things can work for different couples. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking too, you, you offer an anecdote in the book, more love, less conflict, um, during the exercise about 
uh, withholding and and mm -hmm. couples being able to give a voice to the things that they've been holding back from each other. And, you know, that that's something that could be really edgy or scary, um, depending on what's being withheld. Um, but even there, you talk about um, wanting people to to end on a positive note, something maybe really good or a deep desire that they've been withholding. And and you, you mentioned this one couple that, that talks about kind of how uh, in trouble their marriage is and um, how one is feeling hopeless and the other has been flirting with someone at the office. And these are coming out in the withholdings, but then they end with these statements about um, really wanting to feel connected with each other and how and how much it feels like that shifts the dynamic for them even though they've also offered some incredibly vulnerable and hard truths to each other yeah you know one moment of vulnerability or appreciation seems to be able to overshadow even years of negativity you know, i've had couples who come into my office they've been arguing and screaming at each other for decades and Sometimes I'll have them do a couple of positive things like saying what they appreciate or being vulnerable through certain sentence stems. And 10 minutes later, they're holding hands and loving. And I find that is like a miracle, you know, because they've had years of negativity and yet their hearts really want to have that connection. They just haven't had the simple, reliable way of doing that. But once they do have that way, uh, the bonding can happen very, very quickly. And I think that's a real testament to the human heart and spirit. Yeah, yeah, the light it shines is much brighter than than the darkness we can find ourselves in at times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and just to be clear for you listening, so the, the withholding sentence stem, I just happen to have it in front of me right here. Um, there's something I've been withholding, would you like to hear it? So again, important that your partner actually know that they're about to receive something. Um, and then this is one of those cases where you um, mentioned, Jonathan, that it's helpful to create a container that, that says we're not even, we're not gonna talk about this for 24 hours and, and what is being offered is, um, is held sacred in some way, um, mm -hmm. which is a great spin on it because I think so often when something is uh, revealed that's been withheld, it can just in and of itself, no matter what the content is, feel like a, a betrayal of some sort. Yeah, yeah. And that's probably the edgiest exercise in the book. And it's not something that one starts with. You kind of build to that because it's if you're going to deal with difficult stuff, it's good to have some love in your emotional bank account. Yeah. You know, because those types of things are like a withdrawal and you don't want to withdraw into bankruptcy. So I, <laughs> I encourage people to, to, you know, have some connection. And when you have to deal with the hard stuff, then you'll be able to weather that storm uh, because you, you already have a bunch of connection uh, banked, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that for some reason is making me think of two other things that you mentioned in the book, one being um, the higher the higher self uh, exercise. And I think I mm -hmm. like that because we so often want to be able to give advice to our partners or like fix their problems or um, or tell them how they should be that will, you know, make our lives easier. Um, and the higher self is a bridge into that in a way that's actually really connecting. So that's um, yeah, a fun game. Yeah. Could you talk about how that one's done? Well, you, you know, you do want to sometimes give your partner advice and sometimes they, they see you, they know you better than you know you sometimes. So something my wife and I might do is I'll say, do you want to play the higher self game? And she'll say, okay. And, uh, we take turns kind of being each other's guru. So I might say, well, I'm married to this woman who, who gets self-righteous really quickly. Uh, dear uh, guru, what would you suggest I do when she gets really reactive and self-righteous quickly? 
<laughs> and then she has to answer as like a relationship guru, you know, well, sounds like, you know, you have, you might want to try this, this, and this. And it's kind of fun because it's, it rather than going back and forth and trying to prove that we're right, or you should do this, it's kind of like a game and it sets it up in a fun way where I can hear what she has to say. And a lot of times her advice to me about her has been right on because, you know, she knows what I'm doing that might make it better for her. Uh, yeah. and, and it's just kind of a fun way of being with each other where you can temporarily go into the role of advice giver or teacher without all the, all the normal ramifications of that. Yeah. And, and you mention uh, a, an important aspect of that often being that the advice giver guru person sit with their eyes closed or blindfolded. Yes, because that changes the, the normal uh, mechanical way that you might be with each other. When you close your eyes and you're trying to give advice, it tends to help you to go deeper within. And it also shuts you off from whether your partner is reacting to your advice. You get to really tune in to it. What do I have to say to this question? And that way it can be more pure and more truthful rather than a mechanical reaction to, to maybe how you think they're going to take it. Got it. I must say, Neil, I think you know your this book better than I do at this point. I'm very <laughs> impressed. Well, it's fresh in my mind, so that's Good. that's helpful. And but don't worry, there will be no test. Uh, okay. Nothing more than what we're already doing, I guess. Okay. Um, it seems important to clarify too that if it's if you're not doing that one as a structured exercise, one thing I noticed was that the the simple practice isn't an offer to give your partner advice it's it's asking them for advice can i can i get your best advice about something so if you were going to yeah. sort of surreptitiously engage their higher self that's how you come at it um when you're when you're doing it more renegade style yeah and people love that question you know uh gee honey can i get your best advice about this and that's usually that asking for help in that vulnerable way usually leads to a lot more intimacy when it comes to knowing your partner better, and this is, you know, we touched on this earlier when we were talking about the desires and, and wondering whether or not we actually know what our partner's deepest desires are. And that's something I appreciate about that list of 50. I mean, I'm sure there are, there are more than that, right? But, but 50 is a pretty good start. And, and it helps you, I think, access the nuances of how these desires are, are slightly different than each other. Um, and I think it's also important, um, I loved your exercise on the, the perfect partner and how, how we can share information with each other in a safe way about what we wish we were experiencing um, from the other person as a way to help them. It's like, I'm helping you help me. Yeah, it's kind of like painting a picture. You know, sometimes the best way to learn is through an example. And, you know, somebody can tell you uh, what Yosemite looks like, but one picture of Yosemite and, you know, the game's over. You don't need to say anything more. And the same thing with what we want. So writing out what my perfect partner would do or what my perfect partner would say helps me to get an example of what my wife is really wanting. You know, because I always thought that she wanted me to fix her problems. And then she wrote out, well, my perfect partner would say this, this, and this. And she never mentions fixing her problems. She really wanted somebody who is incredibly empathetic. And when I really understood that it, she's not wanting my advice, she's wanting my, my empathy, my understanding, it helped me to change how I, how I was with her. And now she has said, wow, you're really good at being my perfect partner now. And, you know, th of course, that leads to more love. Yeah, I did an episode a while ago on 
writing the user manual for you, for your partner. <laughs> like uh -huh. this is kind of my guide to me and, and how that can be such a sweet offering to your partner. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on how to do that in a way that doesn't come across as a criticism. Uh huh. Well, um, one sentence stem that can be a very simple way of doing it is to say something like uh, three things that tend to trigger me are so you're you're talking about you rather than your partner, or three things that. Uh, almost always lead me to feel more loving are because, you know, a lot of times we'll say that that person really pushes our buttons. Well, it's good to tell your partner what your buttons are so yeah. that they know to avoid them. But we not only have upset buttons, we have love buttons. You know, if my wife gives me a shoulder massage, I, I love her. Uh, you know, a gorilla could give me a shoulder massage. I'd love that gorilla. You know, that's just how I'm wired. Whereas if I, um, speak to my wife in a certain tone of voice that she finds very loving, that is her love button. So just knowing what really triggers your partner towards upset or towards love in a very simple way is very valuable information. A lot of couples really don't know that information. You know, that just feels like how helpful would that be in general if we just knew that about each other? Um, yeah. I've heard... Dan Sullivan, who who has uh, he leads this company called Strategic Coach. Um, he he talks about that in the context of the work environment and like giving the people who work with you the like this is the recipe. If you want to piss me off, these are the things you can do. And they yeah. and you know and basically listing all the kind of triggers that that he has and um, and if nothing else, once you know what triggers your partner you got to think twice before doing it or after you do it maybe you'll think again like oh i just did that thing that yeah i know triggers triggers them one thing that people often ask me about attitudes towards their partner and if you can have an attitude of gratitude in your heart for your partner uh i find that that makes love flow much more easily and um oh my goodness i love that anecdote that you talk did you actually go to india for that is that story true yeah i i did go to india and i was a little uh, pissed off about it because i asked my friend who uh had been to india to see this guru about this mantra he said made a huge difference in his relationship it made him feel incredibly grateful so I asked him what the mantra was, and he wouldn't tell me. So I always want the best method. So I went all the way to India to meet this guy. And, you know, going to India is not an easy thing. It's 18,000 miles away, and then you need a rickshaw for a while. Right. I finally made it to the ashram. And uh, I wait in line. I get a chance to talk to the guru. And I say, you know, you told my friend this magical mantra that helps people feel really grateful for their mate. Uh, would you tell me what it is? So, you know, he looks me over and he says, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll tell you what it is. And he leans in to whisper into my ear and he says, whenever possible, repeat the following words. The mantra I give you for feeling overwhelming gratitude are the words, thank you. <laughs> well, I, I looked at him. I, I figure he's joking with me or something. <laughs> But he's not smiling, and I, I finally I say, that's it? I traveled 18,000 miles to get thank you? That's it? And he looks at me sternly, and he says, no, 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 no. That's it is the mantra you have been using, and that makes you feel like you never have enough. My mantra is thank you, not that's it. That, that's it will take you nowhere. So I'm, I'm pissed off and disappointed. So I kind of sneer at him, and I say, well, thank you. <laughs> so <laughs> he, he sneers back at me and he says, thank you is not the mantra. <laughs> you know, you must say it from your heart many times a day. So when you see your child from your heart, say thank you. When you see your mate 
dive into your heart and from your heart say thank you. And when you see your, your pet, say thank you from your heart and soon you will be filled with gratitude. Well, I was still disappointed, but, you know, I traveled 18,000 miles to get these words, so I figure I'd give it a shot. I go back to my hotel room, and I, uh, I Skype my wife, and when I see her, I, I really think from my heart, thank you, and I think of how grateful I am to have Skype and a computer and be able to travel and, you know, our wonderful dogs, I'm just feeling these thank yous from my heart. And soon there's tears running down my face. And she says, wow, that must have been some mantra he gave you. I said, <laughs> yeah, it really works. It's amazing. Awesome. So, so you know, being able to, to feel that and, and say that quietly to yourself really can make a huge difference in your relationship. My wife always knows when when I'm really feeling that connection with her from my heart. Yeah, and I was actually just recently in a counseling session with my wife, and she was sharing about something about herself, and I was brought to tears, and it, it wasn't so much what she was saying, although what she was saying was quite powerful, but I was feeling that the power of gratitude in that moment of like, wow, I can't believe that she's willing to, to take on to look at herself in this way and 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 that like really deep sense of gratitude not only do i find it to be so connecting but it's it's probably one of the most powerful emotional experiences you can have when you feel that upswell come from within yeah. you yeah it's a great way for love to kind of sneak into your heart and blossom yeah yeah i have a a good friend who was going through a really stressful time in his life and and came through it um, and when I was speaking to him about it I asked you know what did you what what did you rely on when you were going through all that stress and he the the number one thing he said was I developed a gratitude practice and every morning when I woke up I I just spent five minutes basically in silent prayer thinking about all the things that I'm grateful for in my life. And, and that in and of itself pretty much turned things around for me. So it's, yeah. it's so powerful. Yeah. And the other thing I like, which I think is so underrated, is the power of good questions. Mm. You know, I, uh, on my website, I have what's called the 12 questions of instant intimacy that people can download for free. And if you ask the right question, even if you're with a, a, a partner who doesn't want to do any communication, doesn't want to do any counseling, if you ask the right question, it opens up a magical door to intimacy. And I found that these 12 questions pretty much work with everyone. They work with your lover, your child, your coworker. You know, they're, they're like uh, secret weapons, so to speak, in the, in the battle to have more love and less conflict. So I really like asking good questions. Like an example might be, what's, what's uh, been the highlight of your week? Or what gives you your greatest sense of joy in your life right now? Mm -hmm. Well, people like talking about that. It makes them feel good. Um, or you ask, what's one of the most amazing things you've ever experienced in your life? And people love these questions, but we don't ask them. And, you know, in this day and age, there's a lot of busyness, there's a lot of superficiality, but people really want deep connection. And these types of questions help to open the door to depth and intimacy very, very quickly. Yeah. Yeah, I like one of the ones that you offer, and you also have like a separate exercise that's kind of similar to this question. Um, but it's, uh, what's, what's something that you really want me to know about you? Yeah, because if you can get people to feel they understand each other, that is a real key. You know, I never have couples come into my office and say, Jonathan, we really understand each other quite well. That's why we want a divorce, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but I do get the opposite. You know, we don't, I don't, he doesn't understand me. I don't understand her. You know, that can lead to trouble. <laughs> Well, in case you didn't 
uh, get it when Jonathan just mentioned it. Um, the full list of the 12 questions that lead to deeper intimacy is available on his website for um, for this work. And that website is morelovelessconflict.com. And if you go to that site, you know, right on the, the front page there, you'll be able to download the, uh, the 12 questions for deeper intimacy. So, and we'll have a link to that as well as um, anything else that feels relevant, especially a link to Jonathan's book on Amazon um, on uh, the show notes at, uh, page for this episode. So you can visit again, neilsatin.com slash more love all squished together as one word um, to see the show notes, download a transcript. You'll also get as a bonus for downloading the transcript, the uh, 50 uh, universal desires uh, worksheet. And, uh, and then on top of that, we'll point you in the right direction to access uh, more of Jonathan Robinson's work, um, which is, I just love it. It's so imminently practical and, um, and useful, like really usable. Um, so I hope that uh, you're able to practice some of the sentence stems that you've heard today and, uh, and then put them to use in your life. So Jonathan, um, before we go, I'm wondering, I'm trying to think now through like, because there are so many and we've we've covered so many in this conversation together, and there are so many more in your book. Um, so it really is. I feel like someone could get the book and kind of open to any page and be like, "Oh yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna try that tonight." You know, it has that kind of flavor to it. Um, so I'm wondering if you can talk about the process of like when you actually do want something to change in your relationship. Um, how do you, what do you, what have you found is a good way to help couples navigate like, well, this really, this isn't okay the way it is right now. And I really want this one particular thing to shift if we could make that happen. Yeah, that's a really big area. And of course I talk about that a lot in the book. I think if you have the right ingredients then you can make it happen. If you don't, you know, blame never works, right? You know, you don't shame people into changing. But if couples really are feeling close to each other and they make a request for something very specific and then say, how can I support you or what can I do to change something that bothers you so we both are working on something that will benefit the relationship, that has a much better chance of success than the uh, blame, complain, shame method of changing, which basically never works. So, you know, having uh, good communication, saying um, something very precise, very specific, being willing to change something about yourself at the same time that your partner wants, that can be a really good method for, uh, for couples actually making the difficult effort it requires to change something about yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that too, because in there, I feel like there's also an acknowledgement of how often we actually do know what would be meaningful for our partners. We may not know exactly what their deepest desires are. And that's why I think those conversations are helpful. But, but uh, you know, just like you could say like, and you mentioned this in the book, you, if you ask someone, would you know how to piss off your partner? They could do it. They, they could probably list 10 ways to do that. If you mm -hmm. get right down deep into what you know about your partner, you probably also know something that would really light them up or make them feel super special or loved. And uh, it's I think it's great to offer those kinds of things. I mean, why not, right? When you can, if you can make someone's day why wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the other thing is I think a lot of partners have to be focused on what feeds their soul, what feeds their sense of peace. Because when you feel peaceful and loving on your own, you probably make a better partner. 
you know, I, I do this, I do the, a podcast called Awareness Explorers in which I interview spiritual teachers. I mentioned before, like right, the, the Dalai, Dalai Lama, Lama Adyashanti, Adyashanti. Yeah, exactly. You know, very people. And I'm always asking them, how, what are your suggestions for getting back to a place of peace? Because I think the two most important things in life are peace and love. And there's outer ways to get them. You know, you could have world peace, but what's the chance of that going to happen? That's not going to happen. Uh, so, you know, how can you find the inner peace? Now, with love, you know, if you're lucky, you find a partner and you learn how to communicate that leads to a lot more love in your life. But there's also an inner way to love, you know, loving yourself, uh, having a connection with a higher power. But our mission in life, should we decide to accept it, is to find different paths to greater peace and love. Because when we're in touch with those things, we're at our best and we make a better partner and we're better and more effective in the world as well. Totally agree. Totally agree. Although I, I'm struck by your cynicism about world peace. I think I think it's possible, maybe sometime in okay, maybe. our children's lifetimes, our children's children's. I mean, I, I'm holding out the hope for that. Uh -huh. um, one thing that I'm, I'm wondering before we go um, is whether, I mean, so many couples, this is so ironic. I think they come into, they're in this, that moment of struggle and often really not knowing if they're, if they should stay in the relationship that they're in, especially when they're in the midst of big conflict. Mm -hmm. And, and then it can get confusing, right? Because if you have some technology that actually helps you get along and connect, well, then it can feel like, well, well, do you know, do I want to leave this person or don't I? And, and I'm wondering if you have, and I, you know, I recognize this could be a whole nother hours conversation. So I, I'm not entirely being fair to you and just asking for your like quick take on this. But is there a place that you go that helps a couple be resourceful or maybe an individual who's contemplating that should I stay or should I go question? Um, that makes that practical for them? Like a, a sense of like, well, even if you can get along, maybe if this is happening, you're not right together. Or maybe this is the kind of thing you don't want to tolerate. Or um, yeah, how do, how do people make that call for themselves? Actually, I think that's really simple. Um, what I find is when couples fully communicate honestly and vulnerably, one of two things will happen. They will either very quickly get back to a place of deep love and connection, in which case, of course, they want to stay together. Or if they're very honest and communicating without blame and letting out all the things that they've been withholding, they may get to a place where they realize they want totally different things. And then they would naturally want to separate because we're not, we're not going after the same things in life anymore. But the key is really good communication. It will create the clarity that often is not there when couples are not so honest or so clear and vulnerable in their communication. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And, and I think it's important to qualify that just because you have, you want two completely different things or 10 completely different things, that doesn't necessarily mean you're doomed. Um, mm -hmm. But you're, if you're communicating clearly about it, then you get the opportunity to discover if you can, if you can navigate each other's vastly different desires, and 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 that feels good or generative, or does it feel like there's just no way? And in, in which case, you're dealing with a deal breaker. Right, right, and you're right that you can want different things and still have a happy marriage. Uh, it's just a matter of whether you're you're able to navigate those things in a way that is agreeable to both both uh, people. Yeah, yeah, it makes total sense. Well, um, Jonathan, it's been such a pleasure to talk to you today, and uh, I'm glad we finally made it work with all those scheduling 
uh, issues that were totally on me. Just so if you're listening, you're like, what's up with Jonathan and his scheduling? No, it was <laughs> it was me. Um, and so uh, again, I appreciated your patience with that. And it was well worth the wait. So, so sweet to, to talk with you. Um, Jonathan's book, More Love, Less Conflict, A Communication Playbook for Couples, is available from a bookseller near you um, or online. And uh, you can visit uh, Jonathan's website, morelovelessconflict.com, or uh, you can check out his podcast that he just mentioned, Awareness Explorers, which is fascinating, uh, conversations with pioneers on the edge of consciousness. And uh, and Jonathan, is there anything else you'd like to add about you know ways people can find out about your work? I know you have a, a totally different body of work that you do as well. And so, if there's anything you'd like to add right now, this would be a great time. Uh, just that you know, people should download those questions at morelovelessconflict.com and uh, keep exploring stuff. You know, uh, I'm not naturally good at this stuff, which allows me to get good at teaching it because. By finding methods that work for my wife and I, it really made a huge difference. I also want to say, Neil, you're a great interviewer. I see why your podcast is so popular. Uh, it was really fun to go into some depth about some of these issues and hopefully help some people. Well, thank you so much for saying that. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to another episode of Relationship Alive. If you like what you've heard and want to make it easier for other people to find out about us, please take a moment to subscribe to our podcast and to rate and review us on iTunes. If you have questions or comments or want to continue the conversation, you can always join our Relationship Alive community Facebook group. And for more information about today's episode, visit us online at neilsatin.com slash podcast. Or you can always text the word passion, P-A-S-S-I-O-N, to the number 33444 for more information. Finally, do you have a burning question that you're hoping we can have answered here on Relationship Alive, either for a future or past guest? Let me know and I'll see what I can do. Take care and see you next time.